This screencast should serve as an introduction to some of the more common or important diffuse and interstitial lung diseases that you will encounter in this course and in medical practice. At the end of this screencast, you should be able to recognize and name common forms of interstitial lung disease. And you should categorize the disease as primarily diffuse, nodular, or cystic on imaging. We'll start with what is one of the most common diffuse lung diseases, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Cardiogenic pulmonary edema has a large spectrum that can progress from interstitial edema to alveolar edema. It has a classic presentation in which people tend to have shortness of breath when they're lying flat. Their shortness of breath may often wake them from sleep, and it is predominantly caused by heart failure, specifically left heart failure. On radiographs, pulmonary edema is classically evident with curly B's lines, which represents the interstitial edema or the thickening of the intralobular septa of the secondary pulmonary lobule. And then as it progresses, it can move on to ground glass or consolidation where the fluid begins to fill the air spaces. There is typically associated pleural effusions and cardiomegaly, and it's treated with diuretics or treatment of the heart failure etiology. Non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema can have a similar appearance on imaging. It tends to be a very acute onset in its presentation, and it's not associated with heart failure. The etiologies for non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema are very broad, but there is a classic differential diagnosis. So diffuse alveolar damage, also known as acute respiratory stress syndrome, has its own whole set of etiologies, but is a category of non-cardiogenic edema. Sepsis uh, can cause non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. There are a number of different drugs that can result in edema. People who rapidly move to a high altitude, such as someone flying into Aspen, Colorado, can develop pulmonary edema. People who have inhalation of chemicals or smoke or heated air can have cardiogenic edema. And then people with stroke can develop non-cardiogenic edema. Similar to cardiogenic edema, you can get curly B's lines from the interstitial edema, and you can get ground glass or consolidation from the alveolar edema, but distinguishing it from cardiogenic edema, there's no cardiomegaly and there's no pleural effusion, and you typically treat it with respiratory support. Pulmonary alveolar protonosis is a less common diffuse lung disease that can often have a similar radiographic appearance to non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Patients typically are going to present with progressive shortness of breath and a productive cough, and they may sometimes have constitutional symptoms such as fever or weakness. It's felt to be an autoimmune disease, and similar to non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you get thickening of the interlobular septa, and you get diffuse ground glass. Classically, this is described as a crazy paving pattern, and I'm showing you an example of paving stones above this representative chest CT of a case of pulmonary alveolar prognosis. You do not typically have effusions or cardiomegaly with pulmonary alveolar prognosis, and the classic treatment is bronchiolar lavage. Hypersensitivity pneumonia is another important diffuse lung disease. It's unique and then its presentation and radiographic findings have multiple stages. Acutely, people may present with cough, fever, and hypoxia or shortness of breath. And on imaging, we'll see diffuse ground glass within the lungs. In the subacute phase, patients may have an indolent cough, can have developed low-grade fever or intermittent fever, and may show weight loss. And on radiographs, there's a classic upper lobe predominant ground glass central lobular nodules scattered throughout both lungs. As hypersensitivity pneumonia goes undiagnosed, it will continue to progress with increasing constitutional symptoms, and on radiographs it will start to show a fibrotic pattern of lung disease with honeycombing 
bronchiectasis, and this can progress to end-stage fibrosis. The treatment is removal or reduction of antigen exposure. Oftentimes, unfortunately, the antigen is unknown, and classically, patients with hypersensitivity pneumonia are farmers or bird handlers exposed to high levels of environmental antigens. As we move on from a more diffuse lung disease to a more nodular lung disease, we're going to get into sarcoidosis, one of the more common nodular interstitial lung diseases. Sarcoidosis has a variable presentation due to its ability to affect multiple different organ systems. In this case, we're going to talk about pulmonary sarcoidosis. Typically, sarcoidosis is diagnosed in middle-aged African Americans. It, again, affects multiple different systems, but a large number of patients will actually be asymptomatic at the time of diagnosis. Respiratory manifestations and then skin manifestations are what most commonly bring patients to uh, the hospital or result in a diagnosis, although cardiac sarcoid and arrhythmia is related to that are common as well. The etiology of sarcoid is relatively unknown and the diagnosis of sarcoid is made when a biopsy or a sample show non-caseating granulomas. When we look at chest radiographs and chest CT, we will often see a very classic pattern of adenopathy, sometimes described as the one, two, three. So you have paratracheal adenopathy here. You will then have bilateral hilar adenopathy and subcarinal adenopathy. In the lung parenchyma itself, we often see an upper lobe predominance, and we see perilymphatic nodules with decrease in the lung volume, and this can eventually progress to large areas of fibrosis, referred to as progressive massive fibrosis. Sarcoidosis is primarily treated with steroids. Pneumoconioses encompass a large range of interstitial lung diseases that predominantly manifest as a nodular interstitial lung disease, and the etiologies are vast. In this region, we commonly think of a coal worker's pneumoconiosis, sometimes referred to as black lung, but other environmental antigens often encountered through occupational exposure can result in various pneumoconioses. Silicon, beryllium, and asbestos are other classic etiologies for pneumoconioses. In general, pneumoconioses are upper lobe predominant micronodular interstitial lung disease processes, and they can often progress to massive fibrosis like sarcoid. Asbestosis is a little different than some of the other processes, and that is because it is a lower lobe predominant phenomenon. Another thing that often typifies pneumoconioses are calcified lymph nodes. The treatment of pneumoconioses is variable, but starts with removal of exposure to the inciting particle. Nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis is one of the more common forms of pulmonary fibrosis. It starts with a chronic or insidious cough or hypoxia, and it creates a restrictive pattern of lung disease. There's a large number of etiologies, many of them autoimmune, that can result in nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis, but drug toxicity is also an important etiology. The radiographic findings are typified by ground glass opacity and septal line thickening. Reticulation is often superimposed, so you have both intralobular and interlobular septal thickening. Additionally, the volume of the lung is decreased, and we see dilation of the bronchioles or the airways, commonly referred to as bronchiectasis. This is a typical pattern of fibrosis, and you treat nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis by treating the underlying etiology. Usual interstitial pneumonia is the other main pattern of pulmonary fibrosis. 
It is most commonly thought of as the pattern seen with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, although there are non-idiopathic etiologies that can result in a usual interstitial pneumonia pattern. Like nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis, you usually have a chronic, low-grade cough and progressive dyspnea or hypoxia. It's important to remember rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, asbestos, and amiodarone as alternative etiologies for UIP. The findings, unlike nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis, are predominantly characterized by this honeycombing. Honeycombing are stacked cysts in the periphery of the lung, and they're typically seen in the lower lobes. You will also see some septal line thickening, bronchiectasis, and volume loss, like you see in NSIP. The big difference between UIP and NSIP is honeycombing in UIP and ground glass opacity predominance in NSIP. The only real treatment for usual interstitial pneumonia or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is lung transplantation. As we move into the cystic lung diseases, one of the important cystic lung diseases to remember is langer hahn cell histiocytosis. So this is, again, a chronic and progressive process. It tends to have a lot of constitutional symptoms like fatigue and weight loss. People can have pleuritic chest pain, and because it is a cyst-forming process, sometimes these cysts will rupture and result in pneumothorax. Interestingly, langer hahn cell histiocytosis is a mixed obstructive and restrictive lung disease that sort of changes as the severity of the disease and uh, progresses. The etiology is a myeloid neoplasm uh, that causes obstruction of the airways over time. Initially, you will see tiny nodules but as the airway obstruction gets worse, you tend to see cysts predominate in the process. Langerhans cell histiocytosis is highly associated with smoking, and the main treatment is smoking cessation. Lymphangioleomyomatosis is a more rare but important to recognize cystic lung disease. It presents in women of childbearing age who are not smokers, they come in with worsening dyspnea, particularly with exercise, or commonly they come in due to recurrent pneumothorax. Many cystic lung diseases predispose the patient to pneumothorax and in lymphangioleomyomatosis, rupture of the cysts or repeated rupture of cysts causes the patient to have recurrent pneumothoraces. The underlying etiology is an abnormal proliferation of smooth muscle that results in small airway obstruction. When you look at the findings, you often see hyperexpanded lungs on the chest radiograph, and on the chest CT, you see diffuse cysts throughout the lungs with perceptible walls. The perceptible walls help you distinguish a cystic lung disease such as lymphangioleomyomatosis from emphysema, which traditionally is described as not having a perceptible wall. You don't tend to see nodules in lymphangioleomyomatosis, and pneumothorax is common. The main treatment for lymphangioleomyomatosis is lung transplantation. In summary, start to think about the different categories of diffuse lung disease or interstitial lung disease as diffuse, ground glass opacity, nodular lung diseases, which tend to be upper lobe predominant in the, with the exception of asbestosis, or cystic lung disease. Once you've categorized them into one of those categories, start to use your demographics and social history or occupational exposures to narrow your differential diagnosis.